We're pleased to welcome you here this morning and trust the Lord will be amongst us and bless us as we join in our worship together. The evening service will be at 6.30. That will be on our YouTube live stream channel. And then on Wednesday, a slight change to how things have been for the midweek meeting. We're going to begin meeting back here in the chapel at 7.30. That's slightly later from our previous arrangement. So here in the chapel at 7.30 for Bible study and prayer on Wednesday. That will be um, made available on Zoom as well for those that can't get here. But obviously we hope that as many as possible will be able to join us in, in the chapel. Next Lord's Day, I'm due to be preaching at Wattisham Baptist Chapel, that's up in Suffolk, and we're expecting a visit here from Mr. Brian Lawrenson, been here several times before, and he's going to come and preach the word of God, God willing, here next week, both morning and evening. Finally, on the organ there, you'll notice piles of little booklets, and what they are are Bible study notes to help you work your way through um, various books of the Bible as you go through the year. At the moment, it's in the book of Genesis particularly, and there are back numbers going back to the beginning of the year, so if you haven't got those, you can collect that and then carry on from, from, where, from where that leaves off. So I do encourage you, if you haven't got anything uh, at home that you use to structure your Bible reading, then these are very, very helpful, very brief, but very helpful little study notes. So help yourself uh, after the service if you wish to. So now let's commence our worship of our great and glorious God. The psalmist says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart, I will show forth all thy marvellous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. May we have that same spirit in our hearts this morning. Let's pray together. O Lord, we bow in humility and reverence before thee. Thou art the great God indeed and worthy to be praised, and worthy of that sincere praise, that wholehearted praise that the psalmist spoke of. And we ask, O Lord, that we may have the help of thy spirit, that we may praise thee with our whole hearts today, that we may concentrate our minds upon thy word and upon thyself, and that we may honour thee in every aspect of our worship. Lord, come among us then, draw our thoughts and our hearts away from this present passing world, that we may think of thee and know that thou art with us and receive from thee the blessing that we need. Lord, hear us as we come before thee then this morning, for we ask it all in our Saviour's name. Amen. Now we're going to turn to the words of our opening hymn, and that's the hymn number 178. The hymn number 178. And please stand and follow the words as I read them from here in the pulpit. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise him. For he is your health and salvation. With joy and fear to God your Saviour draw near. Praise him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who so prospers your work and defends you. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend you. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriends you. Praise to the Lord, who when darkness and sin are abounding, who when the godless do triumph, all virtue confounding, sheds forth his light, chasing the terrors of night, 
saints with his mercy surrounding. Praise to the Lord. Oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath, come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Forevermore we'll adore him. Now we're going to turn to the word of God. And if you think that this passage is familiar, you'll be right because we read from it about four weeks ago. I'm referring to the book of Proverbs in chapter 23. The book of Proverbs in chapter 23. It's the same passage, but we're going to be looking at a different verse. The book of Proverbs chapter 23 and reading from the first verse. So let us hear the word of God. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou the his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his whole soul from hell. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among winebibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also wisdom, and instruction, and understanding. Well, may God bless to us the reading of his word. And now we're going to join in reading, I almost said singing, reading the words of the hymn number 119 and part 13. 119 part 13. And again please stand and follow these words. Vain and futile are the thoughts of this present passing world, but the depths of glorious truth are within God's word unfurled. Here the Saviour's finished work is to thirsting souls revealed, Calvary's atoning love, only hiding place and shield. Hold me, Lord, that I may give all my hours and days to thee, unensnared by godless minds, kept from subtle errors free. 
High and holy Lord art thou, thus my heart is prone to fear when I contemplate the dawn, when as judge thou shalt appear. For oh, forgive and cleanse away all my falsehood, all my sin. Thou my hiding place divine, happy is the soul within. Now let's turn again to the word of God and to the gospel according to John and chapter 18. Gospel according to John and in chapter 18, reading from verse 28. John chapter 18 and from verse 28, all part of these final hours before the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then led they Jesus from, Caper from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves not, went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all, but ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. May God bless his word as we read it together. Let's now pray and call upon our God. Oh Lord, we're so glad that we can meet here this morning. There is no place like the house of God and there is no joy to be found can be compared with meeting with God. And we ask, O oh Lord, that we shall be very conscious then that thou art here. This is a building, but we pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt make this to be, as it were, heaven upon earth, by coming to be amongst us in such a way as we know that God is here. We ask, O oh Lord, then, that again, that thou wilt deliver us from all the thoughts and the cares and the demands of this present world of our lives which are so busy so much crowds in upon us and when things crowd in the thoughts of God can go away from us 
And we ask, O oh Lord, that that may not happen to us this morning, but rather thy spirit would so be amongst us and so take of the things of Jesus Christ and so make them known to us that all of our beings will be taken up with thee, the living God. So we wait upon thee. We come to thee, O Lord, so thankful that we can come. We're so thankful that we're not turned away when we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're accepted and we can come and bring ourselves as we are to a God who is so gracious and so merciful. We thank thee, Lord, for the sacrifice once made for sin by thy son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the perfection and the completeness of all that he did in this world and in particular upon the cross of Calvary. We've read of some of the events that led up to that crucifixion this morning, but we know, O oh Lord, that all of those events were both prophesied in thy word and completely fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ in order that we might have a savior in order that we may come to him as the one true mediator between God and man, the one who alone can take away sin and give forgiveness, the one who alone can make us right with God. O oh Lord, we thank thee that he is that savior that we need. He is that savior that satisfies all that God's law has ever demanded. And we pray, O oh Lord, this morning, that our thoughts may be drawn toward him and that in seeing something of him afresh, we may rejoice in that with him as our savior standing by our side and residing in our hearts by the spirit of God, we may be assured anew that we are thine and thine forevermore. So grant thy blessing upon us. We pray for one another. We know that we come from busy lives, demanding lives, lives that still are so different from how they've always been before because of the restrictions and the, 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 the very the many difficulties that we face in these days. But Lord, we pray that from day to day we may know thy presence with us, thy help given unto us, that from day to day, whatever goes on, our thoughts and our hearts may be fixed upon thee. So help us, Lord, help us in the coming week that we may not forget thee, but become more preoccupied with thee, that in all of the affairs of our lives, we may trust in a God of providence, a God who works out all things to the good of his people, to those who are called according to his purpose. We pray, O oh Lord, that that will keep us from sin, that that will keep us from the evil one and from all the snares that he will lay in our path, no doubt. O oh Lord, keep us then looking unto Jesus at all times and in all circumstances, for he is the author and the finisher of our faith. We pray, O oh God, for our nation at this time. We are dismayed at the things we hear that go on in the world around us. We think of what's been voted upon in Wales in recent days, where a, the, the old style of religious education has now been discarded. And now schools are teaching humanism and atheism as part of the curriculum. We think of that country, O oh Lord, and think of its past, all of those great revivals that broke out. And not only there, but here in England and in Ireland and up in Scotland as well. And we think of what days they were and we compare those days with these days and we're dismayed to see how things have so declined from what they used to be. But Lord, we do not simply think about the apparent victories of wicked men who introduce these things. We would think rather of our God who is upon an eternal throne, whose power is without limit, whose grace is unchanged, and whose purposes and decrees are sure. And therefore, we lift our eyes apart, above from this world, which brings us down to a God who is above. And we pray, O Lord, that thou wilt come 
to our nation once again and to revive thy church and to so bless the preaching of thy word and the testimony of thy people to this ignorant and darkened people, a generation in which we live and bring many souls into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh God, we do pray then that thou wilt work in these days. As the scriptures said, it is time for thee to work. And we pray, O oh Lord, that thou wilt do so. So we pray for young people and children growing up in a world like this, that they may learn early the things of God. We pray for those that would have heard the, the children's ministry that went out yesterday morning and ask thee for them and their families and their parents that much good will be done through all of this. We pray for every gospel preaching today, here and elsewhere in our land, that souls may be affected, that sinners may be born again to faith in Jesus Christ, that the powers of darkness may feel a, a shuddering blow coming upon them, and that there will be that light of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that is shed abroad in many a heart, that souls may be won, and that the Lord Jesus Christ may have the honour and the glory that's due unto his name. Did he die in vain? We know he didn't. As God's purposes come to a halt, we know they haven't. We believe, O oh Lord, that before the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are those who will be brought into thy kingdom. And we pray, O oh God, that thou wilt begin anew such a work today in mighty power and with great effect. So, Lord, look upon us. We can look at the world and we can point our fingers at one thing and another, but we come back to ourselves and we confess our sins. We confess our hard hearts. We confess often our unbelief and our doubts. We confess our love for the world. And, O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt forgive us and cleanse us and raise us up anew, that we may look unto thee and walk in thy ways with a faith in our hearts that is all and only in Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son. So hear us, Lord, and grant that we may go on in this hour of worship, assured that thou art here. Speak to us and do us good, and honour and glorify thy name, we pray. And all this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Now let's turn to the words of another hymn, which is the hymn number 322. The hymn number 322. Let's stand and follow these words together. Spirit of faith, come down, reveal the things of God, and make to us the Godhead known, and witness with the blood. It is thine, the blood to apply, and give us eyes to see, who did for guilty sinners die, as surely died for me. No man can truly say that Jesus is the Lord, unless thou take the veil away and breathe the living word. Then, only then, we feel our interest in his blood and cry with joy unspeakable, thou art my Lord, my God. Inspire the living faith which whosoe'er receives, the witness in himself he hath and consciously believes. The faith that conquers all and doth the mountain move, and saves whoe'er on Jesus call, and perfects them in love.
Now, would you please turn this morning to the book of Proverbs? The book of Proverbs. This is a, a kind of follow-on from last week. And you'll, if you were here last week or you've listened to the ministry online from last week, you'll soon understand what I'm getting at. But it's Proverbs chapter 23 and from verse 23. And in verse 23, it's just the opening clause of that verse that we're looking at this morning. Just a few words. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. The truth. We read earlier on in John 18 of this kind of dialogue that took place between Pilate and the Lord Jesus Christ. Art thou a king, said Pilate to the Lord Jesus? And the Lord replies, For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Pilate's response to that was, What is truth? Now that strikes me as being a kind of cynical question. What is truth? If I'm right in thinking along those lines, he could have had either one thing or both these, either one of two things in his mind. What is truth? In other words, is there such a thing as truth? Well, there is such a thing as truth. Jesus says that he came into the world that he should bear witness unto the truth. So there is a body of truth, actual truth objective truth so that we can say that this is the truth of the matter without question and without doubt truth compared to falsehood the kind of opinions that people can have that have no real foundation truth compared to a half truth the devil's very good at that he takes a lie he mixes it up with a little bit of truth with a sort of a veneer across it, and people swallow that hook, line, and sinker. And truth compared to what I think is called relative truth. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I remember a very long time ago that a friend of mine in, in the church up in, in London, where I was at that point, went off to some sort of college, I can't remember all the details, it's just the, the outcome of this that I distinctly remember in my mind, went off to do some sort of course in a college and came back. And we were together, the whole group of us were, were together at the point. And, and, and she said things to suggest that, well, there's such a thing as relative truth. In other words, something can be true for you, but it isn't true for me. Something can be true for you, but it isn't necessarily true for me. So there's more than one kind of truth. So it's very subjective, you see. I remember saying to her, well, the, the fire's on over there. I'm telling you that if you put your hand on it, you'll get burnt. That's the truth. Now, that's true. It's not true for me, but not true for you. It's actually the objective, unchangeable, definite truth. And so it is with the things of God. There is one body of truth. And Jesus said, I came to bear witness unto the truth. So if there is the truth, there is a whole scheme that's around in this world that emanates from the father of lies that competes with that truth for the faith of people. And of course, that's been going on from the very beginning. So Pilate says, what is truth? As though there's no such thing. He may also have had in his mind, does it matter? Does it matter whether there's truth or not? Well, there are some things that it doesn't matter in, in, in one sense. For example, if we go to the supermarket and we've heard some advertisement on the television or in a magazine somewhere that one particular washing powder is the best available. And we listen to that and we go along to the supermarket and we pick up a packet off the shelf and then we discover it's not so good as they thought. We were wrong. 
But it doesn't really matter, does it? But you see, with all of the religions that are about and the versions of Christianity that are about, does that matter? Did it matter to Pilate ultimately whether or not there was the truth? The truth was standing in front of him, speaking the very words of God. Did it matter whether he listened to that and believed it and took it into his heart? Well, of course it did. If he believed Christ and believed in Christ, then Pilate would in now, at this very moment, be in heaven, in glory. If he rejected that truth and rejected Jesus Christ, he would be in darkest hell. Does it matter? Well, of course it matters. What is truth, he said? When it comes to spiritual truth, when it comes to the things of God, we dare not get it wrong. It matters forevermore. Buy the truth, says the book of Proverbs, and sell it not. Well, the truth, where do we find it? Well, this is where we come back to to where we were last week, and I'm not going to repeat everything that I spoke last week, but I'll say this much, that we find the truth from the God of truth. Truth is found from God, the God of truth. Just let me give to you some text from Scripture. We could, we could find a hundred more at least that says the same thing. But, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4, I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. You see, a God of truth. We think of God the Son. Jesus, who elsewhere in John 14 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It all is found in him. Or you think of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus referred to him in John 15, verse 26, as being the spirit of truth. So God is the God of truth. Paul says to Titus in his little letter to him that God cannot lie. Don't think about things that God cannot do because he can do everything. But there's one thing he can't do is lie. Another thing he can't do, of course, is change. And another thing he can't do is to deny himself. But he's the God of truth. You want to know truth, you go to God for it. How has God conveyed that truth to us? Well, we come back to where we were last week. It's in the scriptures. It's in this holy Bible this special, wonderful book that God has given to us, which is revelation from heaven to us upon earth. His word, says the psalmist, thy word is true from the beginning. Jesus says to his father in that high priestly prayer in John 17, thy word is truth. So is there truth? Yes. Where do we find it? From God. Where do we have it? In the very word of God. And this truth is, again, of repeating very briefly some of the things that we saw last week. This truth concerns God himself. How do you know what God is like? Only by what God has revealed to us about himself. What is true about us in relationship to God in particular? Well, we find it in the word. How can we be right with God? We're not left to run with our own imaginations, thankfully. We have it all in the word of God. How can we be saved from sin? By the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How can we be sure of eternal life in heaven? By trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. It's the truth. And we have it in the word of God. Now, coming back to Proverbs 23, this is what we read. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth. You want to know what that's getting at before I try and expand upon these things in a moment or two. What it's saying is get hold of this truth and never let it go. Put in simple terms. Get this truth for yourself 
and never part with it. Buy the truth to begin with. Now, do you remember the days when we used to be able to walk up and down North Street and East Street and South Street and all the shops were open and you could see what was on offer in all of the shop windows and you could easily, freely go in and, and have a look at what there was. But you see, you only buy something under certain conditions. First of all, you only buy something if you don't have already have it. Otherwise, why buy it? You buy something that you don't already have. We don't have naturally spiritual truth. Our minds are darkened, we're confused, we're, we're led astray, we're ignorant, all of these things. So, we don't have that spiritual truth that we need to have until we come to the Bible. And there it is. Buy the truth. Secondly, we only buy something if it's worth having. I passed a, a shop window yesterday. And, of course, the shop was closed, but there was this peculiar thing lying in the window. It was one of these antique shops, you know, the kind of thing. And there's some stuff that, that they have on display there, and you wonder why in the world would anybody want to buy that? But there was this strange looking thing looking lying in the shop window and I, I peered at it and I couldn't work out what it was. And then I saw that there was a little label and it had been in the shop window for such a long time that the sun had bleached the label and it was quite hard to read what it said. But it did explain that this was a Victorian pump handle. And it was on sale for the princely sum of 125 pounds. And I thought to myself, well, why would anybody want that? Why would anybody want to have something like that? Well, I suppose somebody will eventually. What do you do with something like that? The garden ornament, perhaps? Or if your present pump handle isn't working, you can, you can, you can put this one on there, that kind of a thing. But do you want something like that? Well, somebody might. But do you want something like that? You only buy something that's worth having. Isn't the Bible worth having? Isn't the truth worth having? Won't it transform everything in your heart, in your soul, for life and for eternity? There's one thing worth having. It's the truth of God's word and the one who is the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, you only buy something if you want to have it for your own possession, as opposed to just admiring it, there it lies in the shop window, there it lies in the catalogue online. We want to have the truth. Surely we want to have it. We don't want to live in darkness. We don't want to live in ignorance. We don't want to live believing a lie. We want to have that truth for ourselves. I have the truth. I have the Lord Jesus Christ. I have eternal life. And I know these things. I know it for myself. Now, to buy the truth makes us think of this. That to buy something means that you pay a price. Not much that's free around, is there? But you have to buy something. You have to, to buy something, you have to pay the price. What's the price? They say of some shops, don't they, that if there's, there's no price on the, on, the, on the article and you have to ask how much it is, then you probably can't afford to have it. But there's always a price to pay if you're going to have it for yourself. What's the price for the truth? Well, how do you begin? You begin by taking your Bible up. And reading it, that's not much of a price to pay, is it? These little Bible notes that are available over there. If you haven't got something like that, then I encourage you again to, to begin. It'll, it'll be a great help to you. But it doesn't cost much, does it, to, to get the truth in that sense. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? What about understanding the truth? 
Does it cost much to, to really understand the truth? To take it in seriously? Well, it'll take a little bit more time and effort than just scantily passing over the words and say, well, I've read that and I can go and get on with my life. It takes a bit more than that, doesn't it, to really take it into your heart? Because into our hearts we need to take it if ever we're going to experience the promises of the, God, of the word of God and experience the wonderful salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ offers and promises to bring to us. So there's a bit of a price to pay in that sense to give time to it. And it will cost us, when we read the word of God, it will cost us our preconceived ideas if they're wrong. It will cost us all the claims and the hopes we have of any personal righteousness. That's all going to go. It will cost us a life of sinfulness. And it will cost us our pride. So in a sense, there is a price to pay for this wonderful truth. On the one hand, it's offered to us freely. We don't pay anything to God for it. It's offered to us freely. It's for us to believe the word of God. It's for us simply to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, there is this price to pay. All these old ideas that we've so long held on to, all this thought that we're all right as we are with God, this life of sinfulness, this life of carelessness, of pride and all the rest of it. We've got to part with that. Well, but what a bargain this is. By the truth. The truth is the greatest of all assets. And all that we are asked to part with in exchange for it is all the nonsense and the rubbish of untruth and unbelief. Seems to me to be the biggest bargain that the world ever knew. In other words, to part with what's worthless in order to get what's priceless. Paul spoke about this. Are you familiar with his sort of personal testimony, I suppose you'd call it, in Philippians chapter 3? You know Paul, Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, the one who thought he was so righteous and that he was doing God a service when he persecuted the church and going around resting people with letters of authority from the chief priests in Jerusalem, all of this kind of a thing. And yet when he was converted, when he became a true born-again Christian, this is what he said about all of the nonsense that he once believed and all that he once held so dear. Philippians 3 and verse 8. Doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Anything and everything that he held on to and valued and trusted in before he came to faith in Jesus Christ, or at one point, it was everything to him. He was a Pharisee. He was highly esteemed. He was highly educated. He was a brilliant man, highly thought of by so many. And yet now he looks back and says, it's all worthless. It's all worthless. I've given it all away. I've given it all up. My hopes don't rest in that anymore. It's worthless. I have Christ now. Didn't really seem to him to be a price to pay at all. You may have heard me speak about this before, but when we were in London, I used to, every January, every opening part of January, there was a certain bookshop and they had a sale on. Now, those of you that know me well, know that I have a, an interest in theological books. And up I went to this bookstop. There, there was a queue at the door, and, and there I was, fairly close to the front of the queue, anxiously, eagerly waiting to get in there and see what was on offer at bargain prices. And went round the room. All these wonderful books were piled up there, and, and uh, I picked up one from over here and another one from over there and got a whole set together 
and tuck them away in a corner somewhere because they're mine, you're not having them, and got them all together at the end and heaped them up before the person, the, the, um, the person who was um, at, at the till, so to speak, and he added it all up and he told me how much it came to. And I must have looked rather aghast because I hadn't kept a track of it all as I was going around. And I said, as much as that? And he said, yes, but look what you're getting. You see? And that's it, isn't it? We may think, oh, I've got to give up my sins. And I've got to give up my old worldly ways. And I've got to give up my old hopes of self-righteousness and all the rest of it. And all of these old ideas that I've held on to. You mean that's all got to go? Yes. But look what you're getting. Look what you're getting. The truth. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Savior. The wonderful Savior that came from heaven to die for on Calvary's cross for your soul. That's what you're getting. Life everlasting. By the truth. I must say this as well. Buy it while you can. It's what we get in the retail world so often, isn't it? Limited offer. Offer expires Wednesday or whatever it might be. Well, this offer's on now. Buy it while you can. Because the day will come when it's not for sale anymore. It'll be too late. Don't put it off. Never put off the things of God. Never say... I'll come back next week, next month, next year, next decade, when I've done everything else I've got planned. Never do that. We never know whether that day will ever come. God says, here it is. Here's the truth. Now buy it and have it for yourself. Have the Savior. And then when it's yours, when he's yours, you'll be able to say, I know the truth. I have a Savior. I have life everlasting, and by his grace, I have a place in heaven. By the truth. By the truth, says Proverbs, and sell it not. In other words, once you have it, never part with it, not for anything. You know, we may choose to sell something that we no longer want. It's no use to us anymore, so we put it on eBay or something like that, and we decide that we'll try and sell it to make a bit of money. Well, don't do that with this truth. Don't do that. But always remember how precious this truth is. Remember how precious Jesus Christ is. Never, ever let him go. Sometimes someone may try to persuade us to sell something that we love and value. They come along and notice something. Remember somebody came to, I forget what it was about now, they, somebody came to our home and they noticed a particular cabinet that was made by one of my ancestors, I think. And they said, oh, that's nice. Is that, would you be prepared to sell it? I said, no. No, I'm not selling that. I, it's made by, by a family member. I'm not giving, I'm not selling that for anything. You know, sentimental value, that kind of a thing. But they want it from us. And we say, well, no, I'm not going to part with that. It means too much to me. And then, they, of course, they might come back and try and tempt us with an offer they think we can't refuse. You know, the devil's very good at that. Trying to make us part with the truth. And it's for us to say, no, I'm not parting with this. I'm not parting with this truth of the gospel. I'm not parting with the Lord Jesus Christ and my life with him and my walk with him. I'll never part with him. But you see, he keeps coming back with all sorts of different offers. He'll say to us, you can have your old life back if you give that up. Remember how it used to be? All you need to do is to give up your commitment to God your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all you have to do, and you can have it all back again. He'll offer us a life that maybe he think that he suggests is better than we used to have. Or come back 
give all that up and come back to the way things used to be. And you know, you could make a better fist of it this time. You could become more successful, richer, have more pleasures, have more excitement. And so he tries to entice us back with an offer that he hopes we won't be able to refuse. He'll offer us freedom. Well, we dealt with that the other week, didn't we? What's freedom? You won't get it from him. You get that from Christ. But he will say to us, see how other people live. So carefree. They don't worry about their conscience and the ways of God. You can be like that. It's an offer he hopes we won't be able to refuse. And he keeps coming back. It's lifelong. He tried it with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember in the 40 days of temptation? First of all, turn these stones to bread. And then he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. Leap off that and see how the crowds will flock to you as the angels support you in your fall. And then all the kingdoms of the world, you can have all of these without going to Calvary's cross. That's the implication there. Over and over and over again. And he was still at it at Calvary through the lips of the chief priests and so forth. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. You can win the religious world if you just come down from the cross. But the devil was at him from the beginning to the end, trying to buy him, as it were, into that way of rebellion against God. And he'll do the same with you. And he'll do the same with me. Sell the truth. Sell the truth. Have the lie back again. And what's the counsel of the book of Proverbs? Sell it not. Don't let it go for anything. Don't ever part with the most precious part and, and experience that you can ever have. The, the word of God and Christ Jesus, who is the subject of the word of God, never part with it. Send the tempter away empty-handed. Tell him, never, never will I part with Christ and his word. Do you know the history of the, the martyrs, the Protestant martyrs back in the 1550s in the days of Queen Mary? You know, there are about 287, some records say 284, but I think it's more accurately if just a, two or three more than that. 287 men, women, and children were threatened with death, threatened to be burned alive at the stake for their Protestant faith by this Roman Catholic queen. Two of them were burned at the stake just not far from here in Chichester, plaques outside on the wall above the gate, above the door of the church here. 36 of them were burned in the county of Sussex in those years. And repeatedly the, the offer was made, if you like, renounce the truth. Renounce your belief in the word of God. Renounce these things that you hold dear. Give it all up and come over to the Roman Catholic Church. And sometimes it was very subtle and very powerful because all they would, they would, the kind of thing they would sometimes say is, well, you only have to say it. You don't have to really believe it. Just say it. That's what they did with Polycarp. Polycarp was the Bishop of Smyrna in Turkey. Well, nowadays it's Turkey, the city of Izmir. He was the bishop there, an old man. And they threatened him. And they said to him, if you don't renounce this faith of yours, will bring in the wild beasts and they'll devour you and all this kind of a thing. But they would say to him, all you have to do is say the words to renounce the faith. And his reply to that was, I have served my Lord and my Saviour these 70 years or whatever it was and he has never done me any wrong. And I will not deny him. Bring the beasts in. I will not let him go. 
or anything. And that's the spirit we need, isn't it? Buy the truth and sell it not. Christ is everything. This book from the beginning to the end is of him. And that's wonderful because wherever we look, it leads us to Jesus Christ. They used to say, didn't they, that every village in England has a road that eventually leads to London. And every verse in the Bible has a road that leads to Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you come to him and you come to the Father and your sins will be forgiven and you'll have a righteousness that is Christ's righteousness and you'll be accepted and justified and you'll be God's and God will be yours and you will have everything that you could possibly want both in life and in eternity by the truth, by the truth, pay anything to get that truth. And once you have it, sell it not, sell it not. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank thee that there is such a thing as truth, truth about God, truth about us, and truth about the way to God and about the salvation that our souls so desperately need to have. And that truth is all wrapped up in the person of thy Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. And we pray that nothing will stand in our way. They'll not think of you any price to pay uh, to, to have him. O oh Lord, we would renounce all things and everything to have him as our saviour, as our friend, as the one who will present us faultless and blameless before almighty God above. And we ask, O oh Lord, that though the tempter may tempt us and come back to us over and over again, trying to drive a wedge between us and our God, O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt give us grace and strength to resist every temptation and to realize the treasure and the precious gift that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. For may he be increasingly our all in all, everything to us. So Lord, hear our prayers as we commit ourselves to thee in the Savior's name. Amen. Now let's turn to the words of our final hymn this morning. And that's the hymn number 370. 370. O oh, precious words that Jesus said, the soul that comes to me I will in no wise cast him out, whoever he may be. O oh, precious words that Jesus said, Behold, I am the door, and all that enter in by me have life forevermore. O oh, precious words that Jesus said, Come, weary souls oppressed, come, take my yoke and learn of me, and I will give you rest. O oh, precious words that Jesus said, the world I overcame, and they who follow where I lead shall conquer in my name. O oh Lord, we pray that thou be with us through the remaining hours of this Lord's day. Bless this day to us as we seek to honour thee in it. And may we go on to learn more of thee and to know thy presence every day that we live until we're taken out of this world to be with thyself. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.